We've got a lot of work to do. We have to pull together. If we pull together, we can go a long ways with quite a load. But if we start doing this, we're not going to get very far. And that's one of the reasons for a meeting of this type, is to help all the various sections get together and do a little pulling together rather than working at cross purposes. Well, that's the end of the overview, and now we're going to go into uh, some of the uh, specific aspects by various participants. Dr. Amplatz is going to be first. Well, until last night, I didn't know what I'm going to say. This meeting, I this was supposed to be a relaxed fireside discussion, and it looks more like a meeting in the United Nations. If you, don't talk, if you don't talk to <laughs> If you don't talk too long, then we'll have more discussion. Okay, I'll try to be short because I don't have much to say anyway. Uh, <clears throat> now, to me, no, oh, not too short. Uh, I was told just to throw up some thoughts, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. To me, the whole problem of uh, coronary artery disease and uh, surgery and and symptomatology is. Uh, very complex, and I do not believe it can be solved by angiography. The only way to approach this uh, problem is by a combined effort of clinicians, radiologists, pathologists. In the best of laboratories, the highest complication is the inadequate examination. Actually, it's a national disgrace, or international disgrace. I think it's our job to, uh, to uh, promote good imaging, because coronary anatomy is fundamental. Now we want to start the discussion period. Kurt? Uh, we have a project going on at the University of Minnesota for the past, I think, six or seven years on patients with uh, hyperlipidemia. And these patients are treated surgically by ileal bypass, which apparently reduces uh, the reabsorption of uh, cholesterol from the distal gut. And we're doing follow-up follow uh, angiograms. And... Uh, we have had no real progression of disease as far as the plaques were concerned, but we had several cases of complete occlusion. Now, we, we think this is also progression of disease, but uh, the surgeons will argue this represents a different process, namely thrombosis. Is there a type of lesion that uh, goes ahead to occlusion? I don't think we could make any uh, sense of the type of lesion which will go to occlusion. It's also very difficult uh, to compare one angiogram with the other because your technical factors, a little different uh, rotation and exposure may make uh, this uh, lesion appear even less marked. So these findings were, I think, misconstrued by some of us, or some of the more euphoric people, as a regression of disease. Personally, I do not think that we have definite evidence of regression of disease. Eric? Well, this uh, meeting is supposed to be to stimulate thought, and uh, it just stimulated a little in me, which may be of some value. If you want to see the proximal vessels better, you want to be able to see through them. You want to be able to see what is going on in the wall and a variation in density across because the radiologist makes his interpretation from a variation in density. So I would suggest that if you want to look at the proximal vessels well, you should not use such dense contrast medium. If you want to look at the peripheral vessels well, you should use denser contrast medium. Eric, it just doesn't work. 
when we use dilute contrast or uh, if we allow blood to mix with contrast, in other words, not completely replace the contrast, we get all kinds of spurious images. And uh, I think with our dense contrast quotes, of course, density is a relative thing, um, we are able to see these shadings. Earl, um, two very short questions. One, uh, what are the contrast amounts you're using at the present time? Uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, each injection uh, um, it'd be five to 10 cc, but uh, really, uh, as we know, this is an anatomical tool, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, you inject the contrast media until you see the distal segments. Dr. Morris. We've all been here long enough, and we're all friends now, so I guess it's time to start laying on. <laughs> really? <laughs> That will make the meeting a little better if we really will, uh, you know, put the lightweight gloves on and right. get going. The Arabs are right. Numbers are very useful things. Quantitative observations are valuable. And I really am opposed, let me be very specific, Mel, to say that that's a jeopardized collateral is is, you know, <laughs> there's no way to say that. I think for many years we've had descriptive terms. And, you know, we're supposed to be the makers of the cookie cutters, not the cookies. And if we don't get out of the habit of show and tell and descriptive terms, a widow maker, you know, an artery of sudden death, we started this conference two days ago saying we were satisfied with the macro circulation. Well, we hear, and I believe it myself, we can't tell anything about a lesion, even to talk to one another. I think for the last two days we've talked around the problem, and I haven't heard a good solid suggestion yet for how to improve anything quantitative so far. Okay. Uh, Wagner, I agree very much with Dr. Morris that quantification where possible is something to be highly desired and I at one time felt the way I think he feels but since perhaps since I've been more associated with radiologists I have come to realize that there is very useful information that you just can't find appropriate to put in quantitative form and I would ask you to think for a minute of histology much of medicine is based on histopathology and yet it's exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, to quantify that. And yet, the very basis of medical diagnosis is based on these classifications of patients according to morphological characteristics. Dr. Gorlin? We are dealing with a static picture, and perhaps this is looking for some compromised position with what Jim Morris has said in, in seeking numbers that we should move away from the idea of simply a pretty picture, but how does that picture perhaps come out in more dynamic terms? And there are three uh, quick sub-points under that. The first, uh, a point raised by Dr. Baltax the other day, what are we talking about when we talk about the degree of obstruction? Shouldn't we talk about luminal area? And perhaps all of us are talking the wrong way. We talk about the degree of obstruction and maybe we should normalize the area in relationship to the pre-existing area so that we might say this is 10 percent area of the pre, uh, proximal portion of the coronary artery and this this can be done uh, very simply using an ellipt ellipsoidal formula. The second major point I wanted to make was the progression of the atheromatous lesion, which we have alluded to tangentially here. Dr. Shari mentioned that uh, it's an unpredictable disease, and I concur totally. We have uh, done a systematic study of this problem as best as we could in sequential arteriograms, and have not been able to pick out what particular lesion amongst a set of lesions or even a set of coronary arteries is the one that necessarily is going to advance to either obstruction or further stenosis. 
This comes into the concept of jeopardy. It comes into any sense of security that we have when we see a patient and say this lesion or that is the next one to cause him trouble. I think we should be extremely cautious in this area. Uh, it's been very interesting to me to listen to a series of um, such brilliant radiologists castigating themselves, their inability. And uh, sure, I think it's absolutely right that we be aiming at measuring what might be termed effective orifice sizes of the diseased coronary arteries and the flow of blood through them. Uh, I think this, of course, is a worthwhile aim. But at the same time, I think in 1974, uh, I'm very impressed, and I'd like to ask Norman his experience, that when we have got good pictures and we have got a patient with pain, it does seem, in fact, to be very seldom that the surgeon does not find what is predicted and, in fact, find himself able to correct it. Could I ask that question to Norman, what his, his experience as a surgeon? Yes, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the pictures aren't bad at all. They're, uh, uh, they could be better, and uh, obviously, uh, and, and there's tremendous variation. And I think the reason that Mel... The reason for this, as Mel alluded to earlier, a lot of people with uh, little experience are going out into small hospitals almost everywhere, and uh, nearly everyone has a coronary arteriography laboratory. But uh, we are able almost always uh, surgically to invade these uh, distal uh, vessels, uh, particularly, as Kurt said earlier too, and I tried to mention is that when the artery is completely obstructed, and it fills not as well as the unjeopardized collaterals that you showed, but that it does fill distally, we can almost always find a pretty good uh, uh, blood vessel at that point into which uh, to place um, the graft. I'd like to get back to the dynamics of the situation. It seems to me that what we really need to know is the functional significance of lesions, not lesions that are 90%, we know about those, not lesions that are 20%. We know about those. The ones in between. And it seems to me that Dr. Amplatz is going in the right direction. He is changing the dynamics of coronary circulation and observing the effect. Kurt, uh, do you have something? I just wanted to come back to the measurement of speed of blood flow in the arteries. I think this is a a uh, sound concept, but it would have to be done under some sort of stress as uh, pacing or vasodilatation in order to get meaningful information. I'd like to call attention to the work of Dr. Kennedy and his colleagues, which I think is absolutely critical for further extension of radioactive tracer studies, that is pointing out that it's absolutely essential to increase coronary flow by a factor of three or four before one can detect lesions that are smaller in size than about 60 or 50 percent of the diameter of the vessels. With the contrast hyperemia, you're limited to invasive techniques where the material can, has to be injected into the coronary arteries. And I know that, that his group uh, have been working on the use of drugs such as persantin or adenosine or something of that sort that could be given intravenously to increase coronary flow. And I wonder if Dr. Kennedy could bring us up to date as to whether those studies are successful. They would be particularly useful with tracers that can be given in a non-invasive mode such as intravenous potassium-43 or substances of that sort. I'm afraid they're still in the future. Uh, we're we're going to get there, I hope, but we're, we're not there yet.